In this video, we're going to explore viruses, viroids, and prions. And hopefully, this video will actually go viral. So this video corresponds with chapter 2.2 of the Nelson textbook. You should be reading the chapter uh, prior to watching the video or reading and watching uh, at the same time concurrently. Um, you should know how to label simple virus structures by the end of this video and understand what a virus is. Um, and also understand the various types of viruses that exist and the idea that, yes, viruses are bad, but we can also use viruses in some useful applications. Um, you should also understand that viruses may infect different things. Some might specialize in infecting bacteria. Some might specialize in infecting animals and specifically human animals. Um, so understand that there's specific viruses that may infect specific things based on their structure. So, the first thing you'll notice about viruses is that they're not found on the tree of life. So we see the ancestral cell, and then we see the three different domains, the bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, but we don't see viruses included in there. And the main reason is because viruses are non-living. Um, and so viruses are often a tricky area because they do have some characteristics of life. So for example, they do have nucleic acids. Um, so they have RNA and DNA, and living things have RNA and DNA as well. Um, so in that sense, they store genetic information. They use it and they store it. And they also adapt to changing conditions um, because since they have RNA and DNA, there's mutations that happen and that can lead to uh, different adaptations in their environment. However, they're not considered living because they don't have all the characteristics of life. So first of all, they're not made up of cells. They are not made up of cells. We'll see what they're made up of later on. Um, secondly, they, they can't reproduce on their own. So they can reproduce, but not on their own. They need to use the host cell to replicate. They'll kind of find the cell, hijack it, and use the cell's parts to, re to reproduce itself. So because it can't reproduce on its own, it's missing that characteristic of life. And it also doesn't really have a metabolism. It doesn't produce or it doesn't use any energy or doesn't produce any waste. So it doesn't have a metabolism. So that being said, all those points being said, um, the viruses are non-living particles and they're not included on the tree of life. However, because they do have um, some characteristics of life, they are very interesting to study. They also affect living things. Um, so when you get that flu every year um, or that flu shot is to protect yourself from a, um, from a virus of some sort. So viruses do affect living things. They are present in our environment and we need to know about them if we're going to find cures for viruses that can cause serious illnesses in our populations, um, human populations, but also other organisms as well. Viruses can affect many living things, uh, animals, plants, protists, fungi, bacteria. Um, so uh, there are many different types of viruses out there and there's a huge diversity that we're going to explore. So let's start off by exploring the structure and, func and function of viruses. First of all, they're very, very small. They're even smaller than prokaryotes are. Um, so here you can take a look at a virus um, and this is it um, just jumping on a bacterial cell. Um, so it's extremely tiny. Um, they're very, very small uh, structures. And what is a virus? It's really just a short piece of nucleic acid. So the nucleic acid could either be DNA or RNA, and it's surrounded by a protein coat. So here we have a virus. Um, all this yellow that you see over here, that's all protein um, structures. And on the inside, there's some nucleic acid there. This one here is called a T4 bacteriophage. It is responsible for, um, it, it uh, infects bacteria specifically. So a bacteriophage is a special name we give to viruses that specialize in infecting bacteria. Here we have the tobacco mosaic virus. So you can see over here the protein coat, but instead of DNA on the inside, it's an RNA nucleic acid genome. I um, mean, here we can see the influenza virus. So the influenza virus, you can see over here, it has its protein coat. Um, but it also has its uh, nucleic acid on the inside as well. So really a virus is, you can't say a viral cell because it's no such thing, but a virus is a packet, a protein packet with some nucleic acid on the inside. Um, there are many different shapes as you can see and many different varieties as you can see and they all specialize in infecting different things. You should be able to identify the major ones that you see on these slides. So if you see this, you know it's a T4 bacteriophage. If you see this, you know it's a tobacco mosaic virus and this you know is the um, influenza virus um, and this is what they would look like under a micrograph so from these pictures you can see that uh, they are very diverse they have many different shapes many different sizes and there's many many differences between them um, the other thing about 
Uh, some viruses is that some of them will have a membrane, so the influenza virus does have a membrane, and it's derived from the host that it infects. Um, so usually um, some of the proteins and parts of the membrane um, will be made up of membranes of the host that the virus decides to come and take over. Um, so the protein coat that the virus has um, acts almost like a key, and the proteins on that that coat basically determine what type of cell the virus can infect. Um, some viruses have what's called a narrow host range, which means they can only infect a very um, specific types of cells. So for example, the HIV virus will only infect T cells of the immune system. Bacteriophages can only infect um, specific type of bacterial cells. Some um, bacterial cells or vir uh, sorry, bacterial cells. some viruses, not I shouldn't say cells, some viruses have a uh, broad host range. Um, so when I say broad host range, that means they're able to um, infect many different types of cells. So if you look at the avian flu virus, it's able to infect um, many different types of birds and mammals. It's not just narrow in its, uh, in its host. Um, so you should be able to identify these viruses and label these viruses. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. As long as you know that the inside squiggly stuff is the DNA, the rest is going to be basically protein coats, or sometimes you might have things like tail fiber or head, um, but it's pretty generally pretty straightforward to label. So let's go into some general features again. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, viruses do have a genome. It could be DNA or an RNA genome. So as you can see here, we have the tobacco mosaic virus again with the viral RNA. Um, here we have some viral DNA and over here, this is called the adenovirus over here. Um, here we have the HIV virus, again, some RNA. And here we have the T4 bacteriophage as from the previous slide with some viral DNA. Um, the protein coat has a name, it's called the capsid. So the protein coat, its special name is the capsid. So you can see the capsid over here, capsid over here, um, capsid over here, and then the capsid over here. Um, and uh, some viruses will have um, an envelope, another membrane that surrounds them and it's typically derived from the host cell that it uh, tried to infect. So upon leaving, it will get um, an envelope. So you can see that over here we have a viral particle. This uh, would be the capsid over here. The DNA would be on the inside somewhere. As the virus leaves the host cell, you'll notice that this is the membrane of the host cell here. Um, it takes some of the host cell membrane um, with it. Uh, so that becomes part of the enveloped virus. Uh, so you should know how to label these different viruses that you see here um, and how to identify them by name. Um, viruses can typically be classified based on their size, their shape, and their genome as well. There's millions of viruses that exist and they're all classified based on those characteristics. We're going to see more characteristics that we can use to classify the viruses. So where do viruses come from before we go into more detail on their structure and how the, and their classification? Um, there's three main hypotheses for where viruses may have originated. The, um, one of the hypotheses is that they, they were small infectious cells at one point, and um, these cells lost their cytoplasm and they lost the ability to reproduce unless there was a host present. So they might have started off as cells and that lost their cytoplasm and eventually became the viruses. Um, they might have been just some escape fragments of DNA or RNA molecules um, that were once part of living cells. So maybe living cells died, DNA and RNA molecules kind of floated off somewhere, um, and eventually they became infectious molecules um, over time. Um, or the other one is that maybe viruses just existed prior to cells forming. So these two over here are basically assuming that cells existed first, whereas over here they're saying viruses existed prior to cells. And they were virus-like particles before the first living cell ever existed. So those are the main hypotheses that we have going right now for where viruses come from. Um, and if you are interested in more, you can read up on this, uh, doing some independent research, watching some videos, and maybe see other hypotheses that are out there. So how do we classify these viruses? Um, so classification does apply to viruses, even though they're non-living. Um, we can classify viruses based on their orders, their families, their genera, and their species. Um, and like I said, they're classified using many features like size, shape, type of genetic material that, that's present. So their genome, meaning DNA, RNA. Is it double-stranded DNA or single-stranded DNA? 
Um, is it double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA? So there's a whole bunch of different ways to classify these viruses. Um, and so far we have 4,000 species that are identified, but there may be millions out there that we still have not identified or named appropriately yet. So this table here is a checklist or table of criteria that we can use to classify, um, to classify the, uh, the viruses. So you can take a look here. You can look at the type of nucleic acid viruses have. So you can look at, for example, DNA or RNA. You can look at the, um, the shape of the, the capsule. So is it um, icosahedral? Is it a helical shape if it's an RNA virus? Um, if it's icosahedral, is it a, a naked virus with no envelope? Or is it an envelope virus um, with an envelope? So usually the virus without the envelope, we call it a naked virus. And the virus with the envelope, we call it an envelope virus. Then you can go and you can take a look at the genome architecture. You can go and take a look at something called the Baltimore class. And there's so many different properties that you can look at to classify these viruses. So again, these two charts here illustrate the idea that viruses can be classified in a number of ways. Um, you can look at DNA viruses versus RNA viruses. If the DNA, if you're looking at DNA viruses, it could be double-stranded or single-stranded um, DNA um, viruses. Um, if they're double-stranded, they could be enveloped or naked, unenveloped. Um, and then there's many types in there as well. Same idea over here. So there's many different types of viruses based on their genome and their structure as well. Um, one type of virus that we're going to study in quite a bit of detail, you'll see it a lot more in grade 12 as well, are bacteriophages. These are specifically viruses that are specialist in infecting bacteria. Um, so the one that we see here is a T4 bacteriophage. Um, so you can see that it has a head region over here, um, and within the head is where the DNA is. Um, there's also a tail, um, and it uses its tail to uh, inject DNA into the cell that it's trying to, um, to infect. Um, so the capsid, remember, is a protein coat. So you can see here that the majority of the virus is protein. Um, the DNA, the genome is made up of DNA. Um, and like I said, we use the tail to inject the DNA into the host that we're trying to infect. And the idea is that the DNA goes into the host and then um, takes over and uses the host to replicate itself. And we're going to see how that works in just a little bit. So uh, let's look at the viral reproductive cycles. Um, we're going to focus on um, different types of bacteriophages and how they reproduce. There's two main cycles for uh, bacteriophages when they reproduce. There's the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. So we'll focus on the lytic cycle first. Um, so here we have a um, bacterial cell, and we're going to show it um, being infected by a, uh, a virus, a bacteriophage. Uh, so we're going to start off with the lytic cycle. Uh, so if we go over here and take a look, we have a virus that um, jumps onto a, uh, a bacterial cell, and this is a bacteriophage over here. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to attach and uh, inject its DNA into the bacterial cell. Um, now, once the DNA has been injected into the bacterial cell, um, the bacterial cell is then going to start um, reproducing or copying the, uh, the DNA of the virus as if it was part of its own. Um, and it's also going to start um, reading the instructions on the viral DNA to build virus parts. Uh, so we can see that over here that the bacterial cell is going to um, help to basically make viruses. We're going to copy the DNA, make protein parts from the DNA instructions, assemble new viruses. And so basically what the virus did is it hijacked this bacterial cell and um, made it its own little factory to make viruses. Um, and once there's enough viruses made, um, the viruses will just break out and destroy the cell. So the cell is now destroyed, the viruses break out, and they can go and find another cell um, in order to infect them. Uh, so here we just saw the lytic cycle, and the lytic cycle involves um, es essentially um, jumping onto the bacterial cell, uh, hijacking it with the DNA, Ma turning it into a virus factory and then destroying it once once you uh, once you've made enough. So we call that last the last phase assembly and lysis, where you assemble the 
viral components, put them together into viruses, and then slice your host by breaking out. And then the cycle just starts over and over again. And that's called the lytic cycle done by bacteriophages. There's another cycle that we're going to take a look at called the lysogenic cycle. The lysogenic cycle um, is a little bit uh, different. Um, so we're going to have our virus uh, land on the um, bacterial cell again. Um, but this time what happens is that the, uh, there's a different stage called the provirus stage. So this is the viral DNA over here. The viral DNA will uh, be entered into the bacterial DNA in this case. And now what we have is we have something called a provirus, which is essentially the bacterial uh, cell uh, with the viral DNA incorporated into its actual chromosome. So now we call that the provirus stage. And the bacterial cell won't really notice that it's there. The bacterial cell will just keep reproducing over and over and over and over again. Um, and every time it reproduces, it not only reproduces its own DNA, but it reproduces that viral DNA over and over and over again. So now you have these populations of bacterial cells with viral DNA within it. Now, eventually it'll be a condition in the environment that'll say, okay, you know what? We're done hiding. Us, virus, us viruses are done hiding. We are going to now um, leave the bacterial genome and enter the lytic cycle so that we can actually assemble viruses and then break free. So the lysogenic cycle is a little slower at destroying bacterial cells. It, let the, it lets them live a little longer because they hide within the genome for a little bit. Once they get the signal from the environment that it's time to break out, they will then enter the lytic cycle and then break free. So when we look at viruses, or phages specifically, bacterial phages, um, we often shorten bacterial phages to phages, uh, there's two main types. There's virulent and there's temperate. The virulent phages, um, they only do the lytic cycle, uh, meaning they, they, they infect and make it a machine, a factory, and then just break out. Um, temperate phages, they do both. They do both the lytic and the lysogenic cycle. So we can see this one over here. This is the lambda phage. Um, the lambda phage uh, can do both the lytic and the lysogenic. So here we can see the phage in injecting its DNA into the bacterial cell, um, and it can do the lytic cycle where um, the bacterial cell will become a factory to assemble new viruses, and then the cells will just lyse, lyse uh, the viruses will lyse the cell, break free, and then the cycle happens again. Or they could have incorporated their um, DNA into the bacterial chromosome, um, let the bacterial cells survive for a little bit longer, and then once signals are, are um, received, then they can go into the lytic cycle. So this is done by the temperate. They can do both lytic and lysogenic, whereas virulent can only do the lytic cycle. Think of virulent almost like the word violent. Um, they choose a cycle where pff, the cell dies right away. They're very violent and explosive. Temperate, they have a better temper. So here we can see the T4 bacteriophage, which is an example of um, a virulent uh, virus, uh, and it only does the, the uh, lytic cycle. Uh, so you can see it here attaching, you can see it here injecting its DNA um, and chopping up the uh, DNA of the bacterial chromosome to use its machinery to build virus parts and assemble viruses. Um, and then finally we have the uh, lysis and release. Um, and then the cycle can happen over and over again. But the point is that there's no lysogenic cycle happening here. It's strictly the lytic cycle. Uh, so a few other interesting things that viruses can do is they can do a process called transduction. Uh, we've seen transduction when we studied the bacterial cells or prokaryotes um, earlier in this uh, unit. Um, so transduction is a method of recombination that can increase genetic diversity in bacteria. Remember, bacteria don't do sexual reproduction, they just do binary fission, but variation can still occur through the process of transduction. So what happens in the process of transduction is that, um, as we know, some of these bacteriophages, they will um, infect bacteria. And when they're being made, you basically pack up viral DNA into the, um, the new virus capsids that are made. But in some cases, by accident, um, you have some uh, bacterial DNA that's uh, packed into the virus. And so when that happens, when that bacterial DNA packed into a virus goes to infect another bacterial cell, well now you just have 
bacterial DNA that's incorporated as opposed to um, viral DNA, and that could be pretty good for the cell. That could give it some novel combinations of genes um, to maybe give it an advantage in its environment. So here we have a recombinant cell made from a virus that was supposed to infect and destroy, but it was actually a, dis it was actually a, um, a dysfunctional virus. It actually had bacterial DNA in it by accident, and that's called transduction. When a virus delivers bacterial DNA to a different bacterial cell and leads to a recombinant cell. So you should know what transduction is, why it's important for bacterial cells pop cell populations, and how it relates to viruses. So if you take a look at this picture over here, um, you should be able to answer this question. Is this is the virus below a bacterial phage? Explain. So I can pause the video and you should come up with an idea for yourself if it's a bacterial phage or not, um, and explain why. Uh, so hopefully what you come up with is that this virus specifically is not a bacteriophage because if you look at the cell it's infecting, you can see that it has membrane-bound organelles. Specifically, there is a nucleus. So remember that prokaryotes do not have nuclei. So this is not a prokaryotic cell. It's a eukaryotic cell. So this is not a bacteriophage. It is infecting a eukaryote. It's not a bacteriophage. Some viruses are actually animal viruses. So the herpes virus is an animal virus. It infects um, animal cells specifically. Um, so over here you can see someone who has herpes with some uh, blisters. And uh, this, these blisters, they develop during the, the lytic cycle um, when the virus is uh, bursting the cells, when it's breaking uh, open those cells um, after all those viruses have been made. So after this part, you should be able to answer the following questions uh, on the concept check and be able to draw diagrams and also label uh, diagrams and explain the different reproductive cycles of the viruses as we've seen them so far. Uh, HIV is an interesting virus. It's also an animal virus, but it's a specific type of virus called a retrovirus. So we'll see how that works. Um, a retrovirus has RNA inside of it. So here we have um, our HIV virus with some RNA, and it also has a special enzyme in it called reverse transcriptase. And what reverse transcriptase does is it will turn, will, will copy the RNA, but instead of copying the RNA into another RNA molecule, it turns it into a DNA molecule, which can then be incorporated into the DNA of the human cell that it infects. And so the reason we call this a retrovirus is because that flow of information is kind of backwards. Usually information flows this way, as we learned from genetics, DNA codes for protein. But before DNA actually makes protein, there's an intermediate molecule called RNA, which is another type of nucleic acid. So DNA will be transformed or translated into, I should say transcribed into RNA, and then the RNA is translated into protein. But the retrovirus is called a retrovirus because it does it backwards. This special enzyme here, reverse transcriptase, takes the RNA and copies it as DNA instead. So it goes the reverse of what the usual flow of the information is. Um, and so here we have, again, almost like that provirus stage that we saw earlier, or like that provirus stage we saw earlier, the HIV DNA in there. And sometimes that virus will stay uh, dormant for a long time. And you may not know for many years that you have HIV. Um, because your cells are just replicating with that HIV virus stored in there for a while until the conditions are right and then um, the virus decides to make more of, of itself and come out of your cells and then harm your immune system cells. So HIV is an animal virus and specifically it's a retrovirus. So you should know uh, what HIV looks like. You should know that this is HIV because um, first of all, there's an envelope, there's RNA as well. Um, but there's also this reverse transcriptase enzyme that helps through that reverse transcription. Um, and the reason we call it reverse transcription is because usually when you go from DNA to RNA, we call that transcription, transcription. When you go the other way, it's reverse, reverse transcription. Um, and then when you go from RNA to protein, protein, that stage there, that's called translation. And so you're going to see this in more detail in grade 12. There's a whole unit about how DNA is transcribed into RNA and then translated 
into, um, into proteins. So the retrovirus does that backwards. It takes the RNA and reverse transcribes it to make it DNA. Uh, so we just finished studying viruses. Now we're going to take a look at some other um, structures that are not really classified as viruses, but they have some they can have some negative effects on organisms. We're going to look at prions. Prions are infectious particles, kind of like viruses, but the thing is they're not a they're not a case with some RNA and DNA inside of it. They're actually just proteins um, that are not folded properly. So prions are misfolded proteins. And what those misfolded proteins can do is they can go and misfold other proteins and ruin their structure. So what I want you to do is gain an appreciation of how the structure really affects the function of stuff, of things. Viral structures determine what the viruses can infect. A protein, if it has the wrong structure, it won't work properly because it won't be able to do its job in the right way. It's like a key. If you destroy the key, it can't fit into the lock anymore. So here we can see a prion. It's a misfolded protein. Um, and if that is present in the environment, it can go and affect normal protein and make them misfolded. And so more and more and more of this can happen. And so here are some videos that show examples of prions. Um, and this is what's happening in mad cow disease and other um, brain disorders um, seem to involve a lot of these prions. So infectious proteins, um, they're not viruses, they're infectious proteins, they're misfolded and they can go misfold other proteins. And these here are viroids. Viroids are infectious particles, but they're, they don't have a protein casing. Well, all they are is loops of RNA, um, and they can infect organisms as well. So they're not viruses, they're not prions, but they're called viroids, loops of RNA. Um, and they infect mostly plants. So for example, many of them um, can go and infect potato plants, um, and they'll prevent the potatoes from growing. So they call, cause growth inhibition in potatoes. And you can see over here, some potatoes that haven't been that have been infected by the uh, the viroids. So you need to understand that many viruses are bad. So there are viruses that can cause diseases. Viruses that cause diseases or anything that really causes a disease is called a pathogen. And you can study pathogens in university if you like in more detail. Uh, so some viruses can actually cause cancer. They can mutate your DNA and then lead to cancer. So the HPV virus that you may have heard of before, there's a vaccine for that, um, that can cause cancer by mutating DNA. Um, the influenza virus has the word flu in it. That's the one that causes the flu that you get annually and that you maybe need a flu shot for annually and hopefully you get that um, if you're healthy and physically able to. Um, and then here you have a list of other viruses and diseases that can be caused, caused by those viruses. So if I were you, I would know these. Um, I would know examples of a DNA virus and then what disease they might, called, they might cause. Um, so maybe you could take a look at the adenovirus, take a look at the um, herpes virus, know what it might, what it might cause. Same thing, with the, um, um, same thing with the RNA viruses. You should go and study those as well. So you, we saw the retrovirus. You can take a look at the, um, the uh, rhabdovirus, which causes the rabies disease. So understand these viruses can lead to many different conditions. Here we have them classified based on DNA and RNA. So as per usual, it might be good to know two examples of each, know two DNA viruses and the disease they cause, know two RNA viruses and the disease they cause as well. Um, you need to understand that viruses can be spread. So if you are sick with the virus, you can spread that virus to other people. Um, there are two important terms I do want you to know of, epidemic, which is when a virus spreads quickly uh, in one particular region. And then pandemic, basically meaning all across, all around, um, where the virus reaches global scales. Um, and so viruses do spread and it's something that we have to be careful about. People study transmission of viruses for a living so that they can prevent the transmission of those viruses. So if you look at, uh, let's say, rabies, uh, the disease rabies, um, that can be transmitted or spread um, by being bitten by an infected animal. Or HIV and AIDS when you exchange body fluids um, or the flu or the common cold or chickenpox that's simply airborne or by contact so you cough on someone or someone or sneeze on someone or touch someone you can transmit those viruses the measles of the month that's again some direct contact happening there um, so if we understand how viruses are transmitted we can prevent that transmission if you know you're sick for example with the flu you might want to stay home and quarantine yourself so that you're not going to sneeze on people and transmitting that virus so more people can get sick. Um, if, if you know there's an animal that has rabies, maybe you won't go pet it so you don't get bitten and that does not get transmitted throughout. Um, 
Same thing with HIV and AIDS, right? You want to make sure that you understand transmission so you can prevent transmission as much as possible. So here we can see some examples of, uh, of uh, the Ebola virus that was in the news not too long ago. You'll have the opportunity to do a research on a little uh, research uh, homework assignment on the Ebola virus just to know in general what it is, um, where it comes from, its transmission, what, what it can do to um, people. Um, and so this is a great resource over here that you can use to read up on it. And um, you can also use some internet resources as well. Uh, and then we're going to talk about, we're going to try to finish off by talking about vaccines a little bit. Um, vaccines are extremely important. Um, there's a, this negative talk about vaccines by some people. Um, and this negative talk I need you to understand is not um, held in science research. Um, it's misconceptions about vaccines. Vaccines are very, very important. Um, and it's important that you get those vaccines so that you prevent the spread of diseases all over the world. Um, since we started vaccinations, many diseases have been eradicated. We got rid of many diseases. So for example, smallpox has been completely eradicated because of vaccines. Um, the HPV, which is that virus we talked about earlier that can um, cause cancer, well, the HPV vaccine is 99% effective at stopping its spread. Um, so it's amazing how um, well vaccines actually work. Um, and so some, what vaccines are is they're mixtures that contain weakened parts or forms of the virus. And what they do is they, you, you're injected with those weakened parts of the virus and your immune system recognizes those weakened parts and it creates cells, memory cells, they're actually memory cells that will remember what the virus looks like if it actually infects you the next time. So if you get a vaccine for a virus, um, when that virus actually tries to infect you, your immune system will say, I know who you are, I got this, I already developed a defense for it, I learned from last time. So now I can destroy that virus very easily or much easier than I could have without the, without the um, vaccine and we'll be fine. Um, so that's really what a vaccine is. It's just kind of a, um, think of it like a fire drill. If you have a fire drill at school, um, we know it's not a real fire, um, but we go through the motions and we know what to do in the event of a real fire. So when a real fire happens, we can exit the building in a safe way. So think of the vaccine like a fire drill for your immune system. Um, so vaccines are great, but I mean, we don't have a vaccine for every virus yet. Some viruses have a difficult structure to comprehend. For example, the HIV virus is difficult to really understand and develop a vaccine for, um, but that's why we study viruses so much. So the more we know the virus, the more we can, the better we are in a position to create a virus for, um, to create a vaccine for the viruses that we don't quite yet understand. Some viruses uh, need a vaccine to be updated constantly. So for example, uh, the flu virus, the influenza virus, um, it mutates year after year. And so um, that's why the flu shot is different. That's why there's an annual flu shot that you need to get um, because that virus changes over time. Um, so it is important to get that flu shot. Um, even if you're a healthy person, for example, even if you're infected by a virus, but you don't feel symptoms, it might just be because you have a um, better immune system and you, you don't, you don't, you're not as vulnerable. However, you still carry the virus and um, you can spread that virus to people who are not as lucky as you. So you might spread that to older people or more vulnerable younger people with the weak, weaker immune system. So it's not just about yourself that you need to think about when it comes to vaccines. It's about those people around you who can't survive if they're infected by the viruses. So stop the spread, get those vaccines. Um, they're very important. There's a lot about vaccines in the news. Um, don't believe those negative things that you hear about vaccines causing autism because they're not supported in science by research. Make sure you do your own research and make sure you talk to educated people about those vaccines as well. Talk to your doctor if there's something you're not sure of. So these are just some videos about anti-vaccination um, and the mentality behind it, the psychology behind people who are anti-vaxxers, people who don't support vaccines um, for no reason whatsoever, or let's just say no scientific reason, I should say. Um, but re watch these videos to understand the uh, mentality behind anti-vaccination. Uh, so again, this is how vaccines work. Um, essentially, you inject uh, some dead, modified version of the um, virus into a human. Uh, the immune system will recognize antigens present on the virus. Antigens are part of the, um, the, uh, the virus that uh, the immune system will recognize. Um, the immune system will create what's called antibodies. Um, the antibodies will 
uh, have a specific shape that will be able to recognize the antigen next time it comes around. So when there's a real infection um, the next time, the uh, antibody created by your uh, immune system will be able to destroy the uh, virus by recognizing the antigens and doing its thing. And so you'll learn more about the immune system in grade 12, but you've basically just created a memory bank, a system of memory cells that recognize the virus next time it comes in. So this is our body being uh, actually being infected by the virus itself because we already have the antibodies that were made from the fire drill that we created in the first scenario. Um, we now can protect ourselves in this real infection. So viruses, as we said, can cause diseases. They can be very bad for us, but they can also have some practical and useful applications. Uh, so one example of a great use for viruses is gene therapy. So um, in, during gene therapy, we want to inject a good copy of a gene into a uh, cell that has a bad copy. And to deliver that good copy, you need some kind of vehicle, some kind of vector. And so you could use the virus as a vector or a vehicle to deliver the good copy of the gene to the uh, DNA found within your nucleus. So gene therapy will often employ uh, viruses um, to deliver the good copy of the gene. Uh, you can see here other examples of viral technology that have some positive applications. So using a virus to insert a new gene, we've already seen. Using a virus to insert a gene taken from another species. So if we want to create some GMOs, for example, um, and using a virus uh, capsule to deliver a drug. So sometimes you can actually put in a drug um, into a virus capsule and you can deliver that um, drug to specific parts of the body, for example, maybe to a tumor cell um, that you might want to uh, kill and avoid hurting other cells in your body. So uh, the next few slides are a series of uh, viruses that you should be able to recognize and um, you should have a general idea as to what they do. Um, so here we have the uh, Ebola virus. There's some great sources that you can read up on the Ebola virus over here. Great videos to watch to understand what the Ebola virus is. Understand that it's an RNA virus, so there's an RNA genome. Um, and um, understand some maybe some general uh, reproductive cycle of the, uh, the Ebola virus. Again, there's some reliable uh, videos here that you can watch for the Ebola virus. If you find some others, please feel free to share them um, on the D2L or other on, on our D2L website um, so others can benefit from those videos as well. Uh, the Zika virus is also another virus that you may have heard about in the news quite a bit. Um, so there's a great video here for you to watch and some great resources that you can use to read up on the uh, Ebola virus. You can see it's an RNA virus, it's transmitted by mosquitoes, and you can take a look at why we are so scared of it. You can see at this that it can lead to congenital uh, microcephaly, which is basically babies being very, born with small heads and as a result smaller brains as well, um, and some uh, developmental delays um, with mental capacity as well. And so here you can see microcephaly uh, due to the Zika virus transmitted to a mother, most likely during pregnancy. So this is the um, readings. These are the readings for uh, this section, page 459, along with the questions that you should answer. Um, there are some review sheets that you can go work on as well that goes over the, that go over the concepts we saw in the PowerPoint as well as a uh, independent exploration sheet on some viruses in the news um, with some great videos here to explore. These are the, this is the summary section for what we've seen so far regarding viruses. So we saw that um, they're non-living, um, but they do share some interesting characteristics with living organisms, but they're not placed in the tree of life. Um, we can classify viruses based on their size or shape um, and maybe their genome as well. Uh, we saw the way viruses reproduce using the lytic or the lysogenic cycle. Um, we saw that some viruses infect uh, bacteria, and those are called bacteriophages, and there's a, there are animal viruses as well, and plant viruses. Um, we also saw uh, viroids and prions. Um, those are uh, some infectious particles that aren't viruses, but prions are the misfolded proteins, and the viroids are the uh, loops of RNA that mostly infect plants. And again, here we have our uh, summary of what we've seen. These are the major, the big ideas of uh, this presentation and the Nelson section 2.2.